Well, good morning to all of you. God's blessings on our day today. It is Wednesday, uh, August 19th, and um, uh, I pray we have a good day today. I was out out this morning at uh, early, and it was cool. It's starting to cool off just a little bit, and um, boy, that's a, that's a great, great morning to be out Um uh, yeah, I was 75, and uh, it was just beautiful, and um, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit, a little bit, uh, all right, so <clears throat> welcome to all of you, and um, I pray you're having a great day, and uh, I, I, um, I pray that God's grace and peace and mercy is with you all day today, uh, no matter what, what the day has in store for you. Um, you know, it's uh, it's um, one of the difficulties being a part of this whole COVID thing is that life doesn't stop because of COVID, right? Um, I've had to do a couple weddings, strange, a couple funerals, strange. Uh, I know that there's some people in the hospital that get sick, and you know, family members can't visit them, and uh, it's just uh, it's just a crazy time. But life life continues to go on. And so the things of life continue to go on. And uh, sometimes those are great joys and sometimes there are great difficulties uh, and great pains. Um, so uh, we, we have no birthdays today. And um, so I don't have any birthdays to share, but uh, I did uh, get a message that, um, I hope this is okay to share, but Polly, uh, who, who listens to this podcast, um, her grandson uh, was pregnant. His wife was pregnant and uh, very close to, to delivering the baby. I think they're a couple weeks away. And uh, apparently um, the baby was uh, stillborn and there was a miscarriage there. And so that family's dealing with that horrible tragedy. And um, I, I don't know if you've ever talked to anybody that, that's had a miscarriage. Um, I have in my life run across several different people who've had that tragedy and uh it's just i mean you put a lot of hopes and a lot of dreams uh you know you start uh, doing all sorts of things uh, waiting for the arrival of this child and it it doesn't happen as much today as it as it used to i mean it used to be the childbearing for a woman i mean the ch the child i think you know even 500 or 1000 years ago you know about 50% of your children lived and about 50% didn't and and the women were extremely at risk of, uh, of having complications because of birth. And, and so miscarriage is, is a reality that everybody has. Um, and um, the, we just don't see it as much anymore. And so we're not really, uh, you know, it just happens so rarely that it's the, you don't even have it in your, in your radar when it does happen. And so when it does happen, it is a huge shock to the system. And it is a very, very difficult thing. So I just, I, I hope that you lift up uh, the whole entire family uh, because of that. That is a very, very difficult thing. You start questioning, why would God do things like this? Like, why would God allow this to happen? And, um, and the, the, the truth is, is that the only thing we know about God is that he is sovereign, that he loves us, that he has... A purpose all things work for good because he is a loving God um, and we with our limited human minds and understanding uh, we know a blip of the understanding of God actually we're gonna get into that today um, we just we don't know we don't know why he does the things he does all, all that we can do is is um, cling to his promises that he loves us and um, and uh, try to try to um, uh, you know as best as we can try to try to find ways to continue to stay close to God and help him let him help us through this because his spirit is active in this world his spirit is active in each one of us and um, so therefore uh, it's at times like this when we can't get through it when we when we're hopeless and, and we're lost and uh, that that God's spirit comes through, um, you know, the footsteps, the footsteps in the sand, you know, you look back and, you know, the most difficult points in life, I only see one set of footsteps. So anyway, 
Um, we're gonna we're gonna uh, we're gonna continue in in Genesis. Uh, I I I wanted to. Uh, I just th- th- this is uh, when we get out of uh, when we get out of uh, Genesis chapters twenty seven. We're gonna follow Jacob, and uh, Jacob, as I've mentioned before, is is kind of. It's like Abraham and Isaac are leading up to Jacob, and then Jacob is, is the guy. Um, Jacob is renamed Israel, uh, so when we have the nation of Israel, it's actually the nation of Jacob. Um, we haven't seen that yet, but, but Jacob is, is the guy. Um, Yisrael, the man uh, who sees God, and we'll see that too. Um, Yisrael. And uh, and that's and so Jacob is is the main character uh, of uh, I mean there's lots of main characters but the, the nation of Israel is is declared through Jacob and Jacob is a major major character and all the blessings of God flow through Jacob but Jacob has a twin brother I mean you can understand if there's um, you know, older brother, younger brother, whatever. But when they're twin brothers, and the, and and God chooses one of them to be the carrier of the promise, and chooses one of them to not be the carrier of the promise. Unfortunately, God has to make a tough choice. He can't have the promise go through two. Um, we we. I'll just I'll just say this, and this is this is. Uh, this is how God is. Um, God is vast and immense and unknowable. We have visions in our head of what God looks like. We might think that God is this, this great father sitting on a throne. You know, we've got this image of God sitting on the throne with Jesus at his right hand and all that. Those are images that the Bible puts out to help us visualize God, but that is not God. God is unknowable. God is beyond our comprehension. God is so far beyond our comprehension that in order for God to create man, he had to create boundaries around man so that man could even exist. And so he created the universe. He created the earth, he created life and put boundaries around everything so that we can exist because without boundaries, we're lost. Man was created uh, with boundaries just so that our minds could even come close to comprehending life itself. But God is unbound. God is timeless and limitless and boundless and all-knowing and all-powerful and everything that we're not. And he's so far above us that we there is just no way we can understand God at all. Um, he, is a, he is limitless and he is powerful and he is sovereign. And unfortunately, with that boundaries that come around humankind, there are limits to what we can know and what we cannot know, and that's just the way it is. And uh, we live in a bound dead world right now, and so our boundless God has to show his love and his care and his compassion to us in a bound dead world. And that is difficult. Um, we, we, uh, it is difficult because we are bounded by our intellect and everything, and God is not. And so there are times in life where God does hard things, or God says hard things, or just the nature of God and man is so difficult that we, are, we can't understand it. And there's two choices when that happens in life. You can say, fine, I reject God and reject everything that he represents. It's not that that you're rejecting God, um, that he doesn't exist, but the things that come with God, order out of chaos, love out of a world that's chaos, beauty out of a world that's chaos, all of the characteristics of God um, that are 
that are tied to God and really don't make sense unless there is a God. That's what you're throwing out with the bathwater also. I mean, God is God is the is the is the progenitor of beauty and love and life and joy and peace and all of that stuff only makes sense if there's a God. If there's not God, then there's randomness and chaos and disorder and um, and hardness of life. And um, and so when you when you have God in your life or when you cling to God or when he clings to you, what you're really clinging to is to say that there that there's things in life I can't know. But 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 the one thing I do know is that there is a God and that he loves and he brings beauty and joy out of chaos. I mean, that, that's truly what God is. And. Uh, and if you can't see that, there's so many people that can't see that. They just can't wrap their heads around God. Maybe they've seen too much evil. Maybe they've seen too much uh, chaos um, that they say there can't possibly be a God. And so they, they throw him out. And my heart goes out to them because God is a God of love and God is a God of joy and God is a God of beauty. And, and he exists in our present time through his spirit and love and joy to help us through the difficult times of life. And, uh, and there's definitely those. So anyway, um, we're going to look at that a little bit because I want to look at this, this blessing again. So what we left off with is that um, we have two blessings. Uh, Isaac gives a blessing to Jacob and then Isaac gives a blessing to Esau. The blessing that, I, that Isaac gives to Jacob is beautiful. We talked about this. It, it declares him innocent. Uh, it gives him incredible honor and it gives him incredible power. That I mean, it's a trifecta blessing that he gives to, to Jacob. Just a beautiful blessing. It's the blessing you'd want to give to any child. Uh, and then he gives the blessing to Esau. And the blessing to Esau is not at all the same blessing. As a matter of fact, if you really look at it deeply, it's not really a blessing at all. It's almost... I don't want to say it's a curse, but it's an anti-blessing, I guess you want to say. Um, I mean, just look at, so here's, here's Jacob's blessing. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness, an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. And then to Esau, it's... Um, your dwelling will be away from the earth's richness, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword and you will serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. So it's, it's really kind of an anti-blessing, except for this little bit at the end. When you grow restless, at some point you'll be restless and you will throw his yoke off of your neck. So at some point, you, Esau, will... Apparently now you're living in the shadow of your brother Isaac, but at some point you'll throw that shadow off uh, from your neck. That's a little bit of hope in this blessing. And the way I interpret this is that, and I have to, I mean, we all interpret Old Testament stories. God gives Old Testament stories to help us understand ourselves. I mean, that's basically what it is. So when I'm talking to you about these Old Testament stories, I'm filtering it through my own existence, telling you how I view this and how it touches me, and then pro prompting that the Holy Spirit gives you ways that it touches you. But when I see the story of Jacob and Esau, I think of me and my brother Mike. I'm the, I'm the younger brother, uh, was gifted in some areas. You know, I'm, a, I'm an investigator, so I, I use that. My brother Mike is the, is the hunter-gatherer, strapping young Gaston that goes out and, and uh, you know, he, he, and we've both been gifted in different areas. And, um, and I've always lived under the shadow of my brother, Mike, because he is, uh, he has always been somebody I've looked up to. You know, he's very strong. He's been very powerful, very loving brother, um, very caring, compassionate brother, great father, great family. Um, but, uh, you know, I've always, uh, you know, I always say like, what would my brother Mike do in a situation, right? Because he's, 
he's got gifts that I don't have. So I think, okay, you know, I need his gift. So what would he do? And I've often wondered if he's ever said something like, I wonder what David would do in a situation like, because he's, he thinks about things a lot and stuff like, he probably doesn't, but you know, maybe he does. I don't know. I don't know. But it'd be a good question to ask him. But, um, and, uh, and I wonder if Esau, I mean, I really, this is why I bring this up is because I wonder if Esau living under the shadow of his brother, Jacob, who's obviously very attuned to other people. He's very attuned to the situation and the world around him. He's not, he's not like Esau at all. So I wonder if Esau had a little bit of jealousy. I wonder, I wonder if, Je if he, Esau was envious of maybe some of the gifting that, that Jacob had that he didn't have. And so at some level, Esau must have had that yoke of not envy, maybe it is envy, of Jacob around his neck, but at some point he's going to throw off that yoke and he's going to become his own man. He's going to come into his own. And when he's going to come into his own is when Jacob leaves to go to Uncle Laban and now Esau has to kind of pick up the pieces and try to keep the family together and keep everything running because now he's the son of Isaac uh, and he's the one, you know, that has to keep everything together. And maybe over time, then he does throw off this yoke of Isaac that's that's been on him since the time that Isaac left. Maybe he comes into his own, I guess is what I want to say. And maybe Jacob comes into his own. And the only way that can happen is if they're separated. Um, if If... Jacob goes off to Uncle Laban and Esau stays. Now they're separated and now they can kind of grow into their own persons. And maybe that's, maybe that's what this, the, little, the little part of this blessing is. But, but other than that, it's not much of a blessing. I mean, you will dwell away from the earth's richness and away from heaven's dew. You'll live by the sword and you will serve your brother. I mean, that's, that's not much of a blessing, my friends. I'm telling you that. And... Um, and it is true. Uh, we have to, but I want to go back and just look at what happened when they were first conceived. And we have to go back a couple chapters into Genesis 25. And I just want to remind you of what happened back in Genesis 25. So really quickly, let's just go back and look at it. This is the Lord. So Rebecca is childless. But let's just read. Verse 21, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. And the Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. The babies jostled each within her, and she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And this is what the Lord said to her. Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated one people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So it appears that even at the conception of Jacob and Isaac, uh, of Jacob and Esau, even at their conception, God comes to Rebekah and says, the older will serve the younger. And God already foretold or planned or had it in mind, I guess you could almost even say he predestined Jacob to, to be served by Isaac or by Esau, that Esau would, would be the inferior and Jacob would be the superior. I mean, even in the womb. And so you could say, you could make the argument, and I don't think you'd be too far off the mark, that when Rebecca takes matters into her own hand with this whole entire blessing and curse, what she is doing is she is helping God, helping the family reinforce this promise of God because Isaac is going to go in a totally different direction. Isaac wants to give the blessing to Esau, and Rebecca remembers this, this promise from God. It's not even a promise, it's a, it's a statement. Uh, you know, he asks, a, she asks a question, why is this happening? And God gives a statement. This is what's going to happen. And Rebecca sees that if it all goes to Esau, this statement does not come true. How could this statement come true? So you could almost say that Rebecca 
in, is the hands and feet of God to make sure that this promise comes true. And she's only following God's will because this is what God has willed. This is what God has preordered or preordained or, or whatever, you know, predestined if you want to, if you want to say that. Um, and God can, God can only choose one. There's two nations in your womb, but the, one of them has to serve the other, right? And, and so it's not just Jacob and Esau, but it is their descendants. They become nations. And, um, and the nation of Esau will serve the nation of Jacob. And it was all foretold in Genesis 25. And Rebecca then helps push this along. She becomes the hands and feet of God. But basically, that's what happens. Now, now the, the question becomes, does, why did God choose Jacob over Esau? And why, I mean, the thing is, is that we, we live in a world that is bounded you can't have the firstborn blessing go to two children if one is the firstborn and one is not the firstborn. You, you can't have a blessing and a lineage of Jesus to go through multiple things. You, it has to, the, the, if it's a firstborn blessing, it has to go th through, the, through the firstborn and there's no other way. Now, if we have multiple universes, if we have multiple timelines, uh, if we could go back in time and split them and they, you know, and they each, you know, into, you know, all sorts of things you can play mind games with. If you're, if you're not bounded by time, space, and matter, then there's all sorts of things you can do. But humans are bounded by time, space, and matter. It is part of our existence. And so only one of these people can be the, the, the person that God chooses. That, that's just the way it is. Uh, and God says, uh, I'm giving this line, this blessing to Jacob, and I'm not giving it to Esau. Now, Malachi, the last prophet of the Old Testament, uh, is prophesying to the nation of Israel, and they're questioning whether or not God truly loves them. Remember, the nation of Israel is the nation of Jacob. Jacob gets renamed Israel. And um, so this is what um, this is what the prophet Malachi says in the opening lines of his prophecy to the nation of Israel. He says, a prophecy, the word of the Lord through Malachi. And this is what he says. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord. Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. And I have turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Wow, now that, now that is a pause for reflection. Because it's not like God said, Jacob I loved and Esau I loved less. Or Jacob I gave the promise to and Esau I didn't give the promise to. But this is after some time. And Malachi is the last prophet of the Old Testament. Jacob becomes a great nation. There's a lot of stuff that happens to Jacob. Esau, in the land that he dwells in, does become a barren wasteland. And so God's looking at him. He says, of course I've loved you. Look at what I've done for you. Look at all the blessings. Compare yourself to Esau. Compare what I've done for you to what I've done to Esau. I mean, Esau, it looks like I've hated him because he lives in a, in a desert, desert with jackals, right? He I have turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. They're gone. I mean, I've not blessed them at all. And God even says, I've hated them. And it, you look at the translations of this, and it's not like you can translate hate any other way. I mean, it truly is, I've loved Jacob and Esau I've hated. And, um, and this, is, this is the last prophet Malachi. And, and so um, there is no question that in this instance between Jacob and Esau, God has poured out all of his blessings upon Jacob and he kind of let Esau alone. And even it says, you know, Esau hated, which is a very, very harsh word. But there are times when God has harsh words. And we look at it and we say, why would God have such harsh words? And the answer is, I don't know. We just, we can't know why God has harsh words. We can't know why God does harsh things. We, we just... We're limited. 
in our understanding of God. But we know that harsh things happen and harsh words happen. So um, now Paul picks this up. And this is, this is really the interesting thing because Paul is trying to tell, uh, he's talking to the Romans and he's trying to talk to the Romans about the fact that God sometimes just does things that we can't understand and he orders things that we can't understand and he, he chooses some people and doesn't choose other people and we can't understand that. And um, so in Romans 9, beginning in verse 9, this is what Paul says. He says, For this is how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. So this is um, God coming, the Lord coming to Isaac and, and telling him, you know, you're going to have a son too. You're, but when I come back, or this is Abraham. At the appointed time, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. And just as it is written back in Malachi, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. And what Paul's trying to say here to the Romans is that God does what God's going to do. God's going to love who he's going to love. He's going to hate who he's going to hate. We can't know why God does what he does. Is God an unjust God? Not at all. He's just following who he is. He is a God who has knowledge about things of which we can't even comprehend. And we can't, I mean, we can try. I mean, when bad things happen, I mean, our first, our first instinct is to try to put a spin on it to make God look good, right? To say, well, if... Um, well, I mean, that's probably too soon. But if an evil thing happens in the world, we're always trying to put a bow on it and say, well, that wasn't God. That God doesn't do the evil. And God is not a God of evil. But does, God does allow bad things to happen. And God is in charge of the world. And he's in charge of everything. And there are times when things happen that, we shake our head at and we say, God, that just doesn't make any sense. I can't understand it. And what Luther would say is, don't try to put lipstick on the situation, right? Don't put lipstick on a pig. It's not Luther's words, but um, they just simply accept that there are times that things happen that just don't make sense and they look like they're bad and they look like they're evil. And the only, time, the only thing we can do in those times is to basically say, but God is a loving God. Now that seems like two counterintuitive things. How can God be a loving God and how can evil or bad things happen? And the answer is we don't know. But we do know that God remains a loving God and that bad things happen. And then someday he'll explain it to us. He'll explain why he did the things that we did. But we're just in a limited human body. We just simply can't understand it. Why did God choose Jacob and not choose Esau? And the answer is, we live in a bounded world. He had to only choose one, and he chose Jacob. And by choosing Jacob, that means he doesn't choose Esau. It means Esau goes off, and it almost looks like God hates Esau. Uh, God chooses who he's going to choose. Now, later, Calvin would look at this message, you know, Romans 9 is the Calvinist joy, right? This is, this is, where, this is where Calvin really shines through. Um, un, uh, unconditional election, right? Is that, is that Calvin? Uh, tulip, total depravity, unconditional election. Um, an unconditional election in, in Calvin is this, that God chooses who he's going to choose. So even before you're born, according to Calvin, 
in, in looking at Romans 9, Calvin would say, even before you're born, God chooses you either for grace or for condemnation. That that, that choice happens in the womb or even at creation, right? Whenever God came up with the concept of you being born, it was already predestined and preordered and, and preordained that you would be either a follower of God God and in the kingdom or not in the kingdom. Like it, you don't even have a choice in the matter. And the, and Calvin goes back to Romans 9 to say, this is why you have no choice in the matter because God is a God, is a sovereign God. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. God just chooses in the womb, Jacob, not Esau. And so he does that sometimes. Now, Luther, who is before Calvin, uh, would probably have said, because uh, this debate about predestination and all that was big, you know, in the 1800s, 1700s, 1800s, big, 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 almost destroyed the church um, because it's an unknowable thing. And why do you have to come down on one side or the other? We just accept that God loves all people, but that some people aren't in the kingdom. And um, it's funny. <laughs> uh, well, so Luther would say God loves all people. Period. God wants all people to come into a knowledge of the kingdom of God, to have saving grace, to have love, to have joy. That's God's desire for all mankind. And if man is not in the kingdom, it's not God's fault. It's man's fault. So man walked away from the joy of the kingdom. Now he either walked away consciously or he walked away unconsciously, but it's basically man's doing to get out of the kingdom, um, whereas God's desire in His heart for everything is to be in the kingdom. Well, that that's a that's kind of how you know uh, Luther would have maybe have said it. I don't know. He never really addressed this question that much. That's what, how modern day Lutherans address this question, right? Because the difference between Lutherans and Calvinists is that Lutherans say. Uh, a single, de- you know, single predestination. God predestines you to God's grace and glory, and it's man who rejects God. Whereas Calvin would say it's double predestination. You are in the womb, either going to be in the kingdom or outside of the kingdom, and it's foreordained. You have no choice in the matter. And this is, you know, one of those debates that, uh, that just, <laughs> you know, for hundreds of years has, you know, man can't know. We don't know. God wasn't very clear in it. And we have enough that we need to know in Scripture to get us by, all right? And if you want to argue and debate it, you're more than welcome to, but it is not necessary to argue and debate it for your salvation because our our salvation rests in Jesus. It doesn't rest in our intellect or our understanding of predestination and all that, all right? So I have to close with just one story. Um, the, The Latin term for this is, why does God choose some but not others? right? So we do know that there's some people in the kingdom and there's some people not in the kingdom. So how they get there and whether or not that's man's will or God's will and all that and predestination, that's a different argument. But the fact of the matter is there's some that appear to be in the kingdom and some that don't appear to be in the kingdom. And the Latin word for that is cur ali, ali non. The why some, some not. Cur ali, ali non. Why some, some not? That's the, kind of the shorthand for this whole thing. It's like, why does God choose some and some not? And uh, one time, so I was, a, I was a, in seminary and I'm walking back from class and the landscapers were going around. This was, this was really a major, major landscape program because they decided to go and tear down some of the trees, you know, and fell them to the ground and plant new trees. You got to do that when you live in the Midwest because otherwise the trees get too big. So they had this landscape plan and they put X's on the trees and one fell down. And they, I was walking home from class and somebody had spray painted on the tree, Kur Ali Ali Nan. <laughs> Why some, some not. <laughs> I mean, this is, the, this is what you get when you go to seminary, all right? You get deep thinking people that, that try to make light of of the world. And I laughed and I laughed and I laughed about that because um, if I put Kur Ali Ali Nan in a felled tree in my my house, you know, people will say, what the heck is that? But 
but when you're seminary students and you walk by, it's, it means something and it's pretty funny. So anyway, and the answer is we don't know. Why some, some not? We don't know. Why does, why does God allow evil to happen? We don't know. Why do bad things happen? We don't know. Is God a loving God? Absolutely. Let's pray. Dear God, thanks for the blessings of this day. Um, we ask that you uh, continue to be with us in all that we do. We ask that you uh, be with the family of Bentley Bow uh, in their loss and overwhelm them with your love and your grace and your peace. And Lord, there are no answers, but we do know that you love us and you love your children. Be with us until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so thanks for joining me today and uh, God's richest blessings to you. And um, thanks for joining me. We'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye.